I want to take a couple moments to thank everyone before we get started. We have a chock-a-block morning for you of really exciting speakers that leads into three days of more adaptation information than you could possibly imagine. Um, so first I want to thank all of our sponsors. Their names will be flowing past on the screen. Uh, there they are all synopsized. Um, over the course of the days you'll see them inserted places. This event would not happen without this very large group of people. Um, and as a reminder, anyone can become a sponsor of the National Adaptation Forum. So think about it. Um, I also want to thank all of the committees that made this happen. If you have a printed program or you look at the online program, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, you will see uh, a list of all of the committee members in the planning, in all of the planning committees, which includes a steering committee, a program committee, um, and the equity working group. Uh, it is a cast of probably about 100 people now who all uh, commit time to make this event happen. So please give them a high five and a thank you when you see them. And if you are one, I'm giving you a high five now. Thank you. Um, yes. I also want to thank the EcoAdapt team. Uh, we're an organization, we're a nonprofit organization of 13 people uh, who pulls off this event largely on the work of three people um, who are not even all in the room to be recognized at this moment uh, because many of them are up at the reception desk helping get people in. But I will point out Alex Score, who is in the back of the room uh, mastering ceremonies today. Um, now I have the honor of kicking off our morning plenary. Um, the, we're going to start the day with a number of welcomes uh, to give you a sense of uh, where we are and what's going on and why having this event in Madison is such a special place to have it. Um, and we're going to start with what we have historically considered one of the most uh, important and highest points of pride for the National Adaptation Forum is that we have always tried to work very closely with not only tribes across the country in making sure that tribal learning is part of the National Adaptation Forum, but also in the place where the event is happening. So it is my pleasure that I get to first introduce and then have up on the stage Eric Lincoln from the Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison. How many of you were on the field trip yesterday uh, visiting cultural sites on the University of Wisconsin campus? Check out someone who has their hand up, talk to them. Um, there is a, we are, I, yesterday I learned that we have the, that the University of Wisconsin has the most archeological sites of any campus in the United States. Um, and most of them are sites related to the Ho-Chunk people who um, Eric will be coming up to talk to us about. So Eric Lincoln uh, is with the Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison. Uh, he's a tribal member of the Ho-Chunk Nation and has been working in the city of Madison for the past two decades. Eric was a project manager for the, I have to stop for one moment, I totally apologize. I forgot a really important thing that Alex is back there shaking her head at me over. There's an online program for this event. If you haven't found it yet, go online. Now let's go back to the important news about Eric. <laughs> Eric was the project manager for the construction company focused on sustainability, then brought that skill set to the Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison management team, where he created what I think is one of the most awesome things ever, Wisconsin's first smoke-free casino. More importantly, though, Eric is going to come and welcome us to where we are and share something uh, about uh, the Ho-Chunk people and um, what he does. So, welcome. Thank you. Oh, the Jopara Janiske Rajawi, Wajanwina, Hijan Kishana, Hina Karagiwi, Hochunk Raja Naniji Sakingaire, Hijan Kishana, Haini Chaiwide, Haipi. That's all the Hochunk I know, so I'm going to go back to English. Uh, hello and good morning, my friends. I greet each and every one of you. My name is Eric Lincoln, I'm glad to see you, all of you. What you heard was a small introduction into Ho-Chunk, a language that has been spoken here since uh, the glaciers receded. I am part of a people that are the original caretakers of Wisconsin. This land was originally called Day Jope for the four lakes that you find here. And I hope you all have an opportunity to go around and explore our community to see why it's been so special for so many centuries. The name Day Jope is Ho-Chunk. Day is lake, then it's Iniki, Noop, Dani, Jope. That's the four lakes. 
And that was a name used by the indigenous people and settlers alike until the 1860s. Modern history tells us that is when the glaciers retreated, they created the kettles that became our lakes and rivers. And our ancestors moved in that area as the land became available. Our own stories tell us that the creator, after making Turtle Island, needed to take a break. Making lunch, making his soup, he was stirring the pot and spilled some of the soup out onto the land, and that is where we get our lakes from. Dejope was the center of the mound building culture, which is a unique architectural feature of North America. Our ancestors often built this upon bluffs, hills, or near springs, and it was aligned with the celestial bodies. These mounds were the first being built around 2,700 years ago. They were not recognized for their significance by the early colonizers and were used as fills from where the capital sits today. They were also seen as a Sunday afternoon novelty where people would go out and dig up the mounds just to see what they could find inside of them. The federal government has tried to remove us four separate times to four different states, but we kept returning home. We did finally get our reservation out in Nebraska, and that's where my grandfather is laid to rest. Around the turn of the century, the government started the mission and boarding schools. The idea behind this was to get the Indian out of the kids to assimilate them into the modern culture. They cut their hair, forbid the native languages to be spoken, and it worked. There is a generational trauma that exists today. My choka, or grandfather, was born in 1927. He was sent to these schools when he was five or six years old. After he escaped and eventually had a family of his own, he carried on that tradition. Him and his wife, my grandmother, had listed their children as Protestants, Protestants in hopes of avoiding that same trauma. He didn't even know what a Protestant was. He was just hoping for a better life for his kids. Due to this need to suppress our culture is the reason why I don't speak the Ho-Chunk language today and why it faces extinction. But this is not a tale for the sake of pity and I don't want to be the downer of a great conference. Um, adaptation is tough in any situation, and I hope to send some inspiration your way. Even with all of our setbacks, we became an official tribe in Wisconsin as the Winnebago in the early 60s, and shortly ratified our own constitution afterwards. We were granted the gaming rights in the early 1990s, and we ratified our constitution yet again to bring it more up to speed with modern practices. Um, these casinos became the economic engines that drive all of our social programming and gives us a seat at all the governments that we deal with between the cities, county, state, and at the federal level. I wouldn't be able to forgive myself if I didn't share this video here in front of all you people.
I know this was a shameless plug effort to get you guys out to our casino, but I hope you understand the greater meaning behind this, that we've been here for a while, and we are looking to make the adaption into the modern world. This is my story of adaptation, and I hope you guys can see the similar thread here. We're all looking to preserve all culture within the changing environments that we live in. So what will your stories be? Pinigigi Naga Hanachakchewi. Thank you. Okay, you'll notice that we are going to follow a little bit of a, a geographic uh, cascade. We started with a very large tribal region. We're now going to move to the state level. Uh, I'm honored to get to introduce Preston Cole, the Wisconsin Secretary of Natural Resources. Secretary Cole has been a member of the Wisconsin Natural Resource Board since 2007, appointed by Governor Jim Doyle and then reappointed by Governor Scott Walker, which I think is a remarkable demonstration of the, the value of a person to a governmental agency. Um, he served as chair from 2013 to 2014, and he put an emphasis on making board meetings open to citizens to see online. Secretary Cole supports traditional conservation activities and environmental protection, as well as connecting non-traditional audiences with opportunities to get outdoors. Uh, he has served in a variety of positions, both as park superintendent uh, in the city of St. Louis, the for, uh, he was he was the resource forester for the Missouri Department of Conservation. He was the operations chief for the Milwaukee Department of Works. Uh, and most recently, Secretary Cole was the commissioner of the Milwaukee Department of Neighborhood Services. Secretary Cole, please come up and join us. Good morning, everyone. And I see there is lots of dignitaries, and I, I see Tia. Good to see you, young lady. And you got to know Tia Nelson was figuring out how to change the world while she was yet in the womb. And thank you for all that hard work and legacy. Mayor, good to see you. Congratulations on your miraculous victory. It was a thrill to watch. Thank you. Again, there's a lot going on in Wisconsin. There's a lot yet to go on in Wisconsin and on behalf of Governor Evers and Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, I welcome you to the great state of Wisconsin and certainly to Madison. We couldn't do our work without you and organizations like yours. That said, um, if you haven't read, you, you may have read that the um, DNC, the Democratic National Committee, will be here hosting their annual meeting in July of 2020. So I invite all of you back. We don't know where we're going to put you all, but we will invite you back for what seems to be one of the biggest events in North American, certainly in Democratic history, in getting back to business in the upper Midwest. So stay tuned for that event. A lot going on with our Sporting teams, you see the Milwaukee Bucks in the playoffs, a long time coming. You also see the Milwaukee Brewers in a hunt for a world championship. So these are the great things that are going on, along with Governor Evers' commitment to the year of freshwater science, to your, the year of drinking water and science. That said, that's an important consideration because while the DNC will be here, basketball teams are thriving, baseball teams are thriving, there's lots of communities in the state of Wisconsin that are in peril as it relates to drinking water. We've lost the notion of being able to turn on the water and get absolute clean, fresh drinking water that we all need from some of our legacy communities in Milwaukee to um, southeast Wisconsin, Racine, Beloit, to some of our farming communities are being challenged by nitrates in their drinking water. And emerging contaminants in drinking water coming from PFAS, these legacy contaminants that found their way into the drinking water 
in places where it shouldn't be. So again, while things are thriving, we have a commitment, this governor has a commitment to clean drinking water. We're throwing $83 million at infrastructure improvements, whether it's nitrate removals, whether it's lead lateral replacements in some of our older cities like Milwaukee, contaminated sediment in some of our lakes and river systems that supports our cities, towns, and villages. We have a lot of work to do, but for the commitment of the folks of the state of Wisconsin and folks like in this room, we can begin to have that conversation once again about climate change being the real deal. We've We follow this group from Denver to St. Paul to St. Louis, your meetings that you've had, the leave behinds in adaptation that you've left on the landscape where you host your meetings and conventions. So I'm proud to be before you today because of the work that you're doing every day in the communities in which you serve. For climate is changing, which affects our ecosystems and our communities in a variety of ways. Many state and local governments are already preparing for the effects of climate change through adaptation and mitigation. So living in Milwaukee uh, in 2010, 2012, better check, 2008, 2010, and 12, so much rainwater bubbling up in homes, in communities, that were already challenged by low incomes and poverty. How do you deal with 11 inches of rain in two hours? Well, we should be adaptive to what's coming at us. We should be real about what's going on for Mother Nature will have the final answer. We need to coordinate our ideas and bring communities together to explore and innovate and develop solutions to the challenges before us. Wisconsin is honored to be a part of the path toward a sustainable future and promoting adaptation. Climate change is inevitable. We need to recognize the factors that drive that change and plan for it. Much like the insurance industry, military, and emergency responders, we are entrusted with the public resources, so it is up to us at the DNR and what we must do. By making informed decisions, we protect our investments into the future. We can right-size stormwater systems. We can handle and plant right trees in the right place, stock fish in the right locations and of the right species, and more importantly, be informed that we can access, we can assess these trade-offs of our decision-making. If you go in eyes wide open, understanding that adaptation is critical to not only this community, but communities around the world, we have a better philosophy going forward. We can make better decisions going forward. What I'm perplexed by, and what we should certainly get after, is climate change is also an environmental justice issue, and the voices in this room are part of that solution. Historically, we haven't done a very good job of making the connection between the direct impacts of environmental injustices on our own lives, families, and communities. Climate threatens human health, including mental health, clean air, safe drinking water, food, and shelter. Everyone is affected by climate change at some point in their lives, but communities of color, low-income communities, are often the hardest hit. And we can tell those stories over and over where we've seen that play out throughout this country, and we have work to do. And know that you have one soldier standing before you that's willing to lock arms with you and join you in that fight that I so necessarily, that we so necessarily need to happen.
Quite frankly, some people are more affected than others because of the factors like where they live, their age, their income, their occupation. Thoughtful adaptation strategies can help us proactively plan for risks, adapt to changes to protect human health. Increased flooding means we can be more vigilant about the exposures to bacteria and toxins that are carried in our rainwater. The potential for increased algal blooms on our beaches calls for more protection and enhanced water quality monitoring. And that's what we do at the Department of Natural Resources. We must plan for how we protect vulnerable populations from urban heat islands in the face of rising temperatures. Because as you already know, trees provide a benefit to mitigate those urban heat highlands, specifically where childbirth, um, or child, children are born early. The last things to uh, develop in an infant are those lungs. And you see this, this explosion in respiratory issues in our towns and villages. One of the things that you can do when you leave here, Arbor Day is right around the corner. Commit to planting a tree in your own community because it has a devastating impact to mitigate those urban heat islands in communities around this country. Never underestimate the power of a simple act of planting a tree. We are lucky to have the Wisconsin Initiatives on Climate Change Impacts, better known as WIKI, reflects the Wisconsin idea as well as Governor Evers' commitment to using science to inform our decision. WIKI brings the experience of experts in the DNR and other agencies together with the knowledge and the research of the university to help make decisions across our state. This approach provides knowledge and expertise without dictating what those actions shall be. In 2007, Wiki's network has included more than 80 partners from local, state, federal, tribal governments, universities, nonprofit organizations, and the business sector. Wiki ensures for the DNR that we're committed to work together with our state, agency, state agencies and our partners. Most of Wisconsin's tourism is driven by natural resources. 17 million people come to our state parks each and every year. As such, we need to be thinking about how climate could change those opportunities support the tourism industry, a $20 billion industry in the state of Wisconsin. Tell me who would make their way here if the water is tainted. Tell me who would make their way here if we don't have clean, fresh air. It's about who we are and the economy that we have in this great state that needs our protection. Wiki provides an opportunity for the DNR to work with businesses and business communities and we acknowledge those business leaders and innovators who are moving us towards cleaner energy. You have to read in any magazine you pick up that there's a, another coal plant that's going down and converting. That renewables are now in play like they've never been before. The time has come, folks. We're at the epicenter of a absolutely sea change in the message that you've been promoting from the inception of your organization. And I commend you for that and thank you. The mission of Green Tier, our business program, which involves 24 businesses and communities and counties that affects nearly one million Wisconsinite, is to assist these partners in moving faster and going forward with their sustainability goals. For the DNR doesn't have client scientists who do climate change research. We rely on the University of Wisconsin to provide the best available client science, client science to support our fish and wildlife biologists, stormwater engineers, lake and property managers, and certainly our permitting staff. Addressing climate change through adaptation and mitigation is our business and our partners that we work with to ensure that we pay very close attention to adaptation. 
for it will help us make a more sustainable future. The Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources stands with the National Adaptation Forum and the work that you do across America every day, and we thank you. Now, those are, those are my formal comments, and I'm sure there are people here from all across the country, all across the world, and as you know, there's traditions when you go to different places. So if you're in California, you may go to the Golden Gate Bridge, or if you're in New York, you may see some of those kinds of the big buildings and, you know, taking a, a game with the Yankees. Well, in Wisconsin, we have our own traditions. And that tradition is, we want you to spend all your money while you're here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be before you. Thank you and enjoy your conference. Okay, we continue in our geographic uh, education of the greater Madison region by moving to Dane County. Um, Joe uh, Parisi, I had the honor of meeting, Parisi, sorry, I had the honor of meeting a couple months ago on one of my visits to Madison. Uh, Joe has called Dane County his home his entire life. He sought out public service as a way to give back to a community that has given him so much. Joe was elected, first elected county executive in 2011 after six years in the state assembly and eight years as the Dane County clerk. So he's sort of covered all of the bases of, local gov of regional government. Joe's priority is to ensure that everyone in our community has access to opportunities to succeed. And that belief is personal. As a teenager, Joe dropped out of high school but was encouraged to return to education through a community program. Uh, Joe, he, he clearly graduated from all of the things necessary to now become the Dane County Executive. He, Joe believes it's his turn to give back to ensure that our children's generation has access to the same opportunities that were available to him. Uh, and I'm honored to have him come up and tell us a bit about what Dane County is doing in the world of adaptation as well as climate change mitigation. Thank you, good morning everyone, and welcome to Dane County. Madison, you're in Dane County, that is, uh, Madison is one half of our population, so it's great to have you here. Um, before I get started on my remarks, I just want to thank Secretary Cole and his boss, Governor Evers. If there's anyone left who needs convincing that elections matter, um, point them in the direction of Wisconsin. Our former governor, who was um, in office for eight years, um, had quite an impact in the opposite direction when it came to climate change. They literally required uh, um, Preston's department, the Department of Natural Resources, before he was there, to remove from the website any mention and reference to climate change, and they forbid their employees from using the term climate change. So what we did in Dane County, we had our IT folks go back on the web, because apparently even after you tell my kids this all the time, after you take stuff down, it's still out there. And so for the prior eight years, we took their information that, that, that was up there that the Governor Walker's folks took down and put it on a tab on our website under something called forbidden information. <laughs> well, it is no longer forbidden. And thanks to Governor Evers and Secretary Cole, um, we're moving forward in the right direction in the state of Wisconsin when it comes to climate change, and we're so very proud of that. Well, again, welcome, and thank all of you for being here and for your commitment and work to address the impacts of climate change. When it comes to addressing climate change, both adaptation and mitigation, we like to invoke in Dane County the words of Teddy Roosevelt, do what you can with what you have where you are. Because while the actions of the federal government have a tremendous impact on climate, we cannot afford to let the federal government's inaction and bad actions keep the rest of us from moving forward. Regardless of what others are doing or not doing, we believe local governments must take charge of our own destinies and do everything in our power to address the climate crisis. About six years ago, Dane County asked WIKI, the, the Wisconsin group that um, Secretary Cole referred to, um, to, to model how climate change would impact our region specifically. 
What we were told then is exactly what we are experiencing now, exactly what you saw happening last night, particularly the forecast of increasingly heavier and more frequent rain events, which have arrived with a vengeance. Last year, our county recorded the highest single rain event total in our state's history, 15 inches in one event, followed by weeks of storms bringing heavy rains. In Dane County and in the Midwest, flooding is our new reality. Climate change is not some theoretical future, it's impacting Dane County today. So it's on us in local government to protect our communities, to mitigate where possible, and to work at full speed to reduce our own community's carbon emissions before it's too late. To that end, Dane County has invested tens of millions of dollars in mitigation and adaptation over the past several years. Our 2019 budget alone invests over $18 million in flood mitigation. Everything from, is it mitigation or adaptation? You, I always get those two confused. I think it's a little of both. Um, everything from wetland restoration to green infrastructure to emergency preparedness. Okay, is that mitigation or adaptation? Met mitigation, raise your hand. That's adaptation, right? Okay, good, thank you. We're committed to doing everything in our power to prepare what we, for what we cannot control, and that's our weather. We're also committed to doing the work necessary to reduce greenhouse gases, both from county government operations and throughout our community. For the past several years, Dane County government has focused intensely on walking the walk when it comes to greenhouse gas reduction. For a number of years now, we've had something called the SMART Fund in Dane County government. It's $2 million in bonding a year that goes specifically for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. In addition to that, over the last few years, we've taken a survey of all the county government buildings and, 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 and looked at where we could best utilize renewables. And as we speak, we're, we're coming up on about 17 projects that we've done on separate buildings throughout um, Dane County government. And the most exciting one that we have on tap that will, that's in the process of permitting and design that will be going online in about a year is a 41 acre solar field that we're going to be developing on airport property with our local utility, MG&E. And this is a great example. One of the things I hope we can, we can do as Dane County and at conferences like this is share our success stories and how we can make a difference locally, again, regardless of what other levels of government are doing. We've partnered with our utility. We went to them and said, we have 41 acres of land that, that we've done the surveys, will be good for solar power. If you build a solar farm there, we will buy all of the power. So for them, it takes away the risk. They have a customer, they have land, they have the siting, and we said, we'll buy it, and by the way, we would like to pay less than we're paying now for our electricity. And they said, it's a deal. So this can be done. This is something we can spread across the state, spread across the nation, where we're literally saving tax dollars and we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Another innovative project we have in Dane County has to do with our landfill. As you know, landfills generate methane gas, one of the strongest greenhouse gas, um, gases that exist. Now, most landfills just flare that gas away. What we've been doing for over 20 years in Dane County is we extract that gas and we take it and we generate renewable energy with it. We have three generators that we sell back to the utilities, 24-7 baseload electricity. But the good news, bad news is as the price of solar and wind has come down, the cost to the utilities of our, um, our electricity generated at the landfill is no longer competitive. So what we're in the process of doing right now, and we'll be going online with this week, is we are now taking the methane gas from our landfill, we're scrubbing it, and we're, in, we're putting it right into, we just happened literally to have an interstate natural gas pipeline going through our landfill property. We're gonna be putting it into that pipeline and it's gonna be compressed and used for vehicle fuel. And as you may know, BioCNG is the cleanest vehicle fuel in existence. And so between what we're gonna get paid um, for the gas itself and state and federal um, energy, renewable energy credits, we are going to be bringing home millions of dollars in profit annually for Dane County while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's technology like this that we wanna help export statewide and nationwide. There's so much potential when you look at projects, when you look from an art of the possible standpoint. 
In 2017, we created the Dane County Office of Energy and Climate Change, and the office's director, Keith Riappel, is with me today. Um, so as long as we know now that in county government we're walking the walk, we want to go beyond county government. So Keith um, has, has convened a community-wide group with a mission to come up with a plan to achieve deep decarbonization. So this group can, um, is made up of local environmentalists, municipalities, utilities, the university, et cetera, looking at all the different areas where we can come from a project-based standpoint and perspective and pursue deep decarbonization. So their plan will be coming out later this year and we're looking very much forward. So it's cool stuff, huh? Um, we're doing a lot in Dane County. And I share, with, share this with you not just to brag, um, although there's a little bit of that there, but to demonstrate that when we focus on how we can rather than why we can't, we own the power to make change. We own the power to change the world and no one can take that from us. So thank you again for being here, for your commitment to this work. I hope the knowledge, the connections, and the ideas you gain at this conference will make you even more unstoppable as we work together toward the future that our children deserve. I wish you the best. Thank you. Would you like me to present this to you? And by the way, um, one of the things one gets to do as county executive is proclaim things. And I have a proclamation that I will not read because I wouldn't do that to you. But I would like to read the very last clause, okay? Um, be it proclaimed that the week of April 22nd through 28, 2019, and going forward, the last week in April, is proclaimed as Climate Change Adaptation Week and that Dane County commits to working with all of the municipalities, businesses, residents, nonprofit organizations, educational institutions, and other interested stakeholders to maximize our county's mitigation of and adaptation to climate change. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for getting us back on time. <laughs> He's the best county administrator ever because he also just got us back online on time. Um, our next uh, speaker, I haven't even gotten to meet yet because you've been off in office for five days? Five days. So I am very excited to welcome newly minted Mayor of Madison, Satya Rhodes Conway. And if I just mispronounced your first name, I apologize. She is the 58th Mayor of Madison. Uh, she has extensive experience in local policy and practice, having worked with mayors across the country for over three terms in Madison's Common Council. Uh, she was elected in 2019. Literally two weeks ago was the election? The second, this month. <laughs> um, and she is the city, she's the city's second female mayor and the first out LGBTQ person to serve as the mayor of Madison. We are very honored to have you join us today. Uh, come on up. Thank you, and good morning, and welcome to Madison. Uh, thank you so much for choosing us as the location of your fourth National Adaptation Forum. I want to start by honoring the Ho-Chunk, whose land we are on, and thank you for sharing your history. The work, the thinking, the learning, the sharing and hopefully the implementing and adapting that you are doing is critical to our world. And adaptation is critical to the city of Madison. As County Executive Parisi alluded to, last August the Madison area experienced a thousand year rain event which resulted in severe flooding and tragic loss of life. In the days and weeks that followed the rain, lake levels continued to rise and storm sewers, basements, and even some streets filled with water. I think our response to the crisis was exemplary. City staff worked directly on an hourly basis with Dane County staff. Uh, we had technical assistance from the state and federal experts. We worked together to coordinate volunteers and plan communications and prepare for possible evacuations. We worked together on infrastructure issues and solutions. 
and also on insisting vulnerable populations, seniors, disabled folks, and residents who don't speak English. We clearly learned from this that community resilience is a major part of our climate change challenge. And despite the label, we know it won't be another thousand years before we experience a similar event. So we know we need to prepare. And we must prepare not just for bigger storms and more flooding, but for everything that climate change will bring. Heat waves and drought, new invasive species, new or worse health impacts, and the potential of climate migration. And in order to be prepared for and adapt to the impacts of climate change here in Madison, we need access to the best science and the best ideas. And that's why I'm so excited that you all are here. We have to be listening to low-income communities and communities of color who are hit first and worst by the impacts of climate change. We need to learn from other cities and other levels of government. We need the lessons from all of the places that all of you are from. And we need to collaborate with a wide range of partners. And I am so pleased to be sharing the stage this morning with some of those partners, Secretary Cole, County Executive Parisi, and soon Tia Nelson. And I'm really pleased to see other partners here in the audience. Tackling the issue of climate change is a top priority of my administration. I talked about it all throughout the campaign, the need to mitigate, but more importantly, the need to adapt to the impacts of climate change. My staff are here with you for the forum, learning and participating, and I look forward to them bringing back the best ideas that we can use here in Madison. I want to thank you all again for coming to Madison. But most of all, I want to thank you for the important work that you're doing. And to honor that work and this forum, I too have a proclamation. <laughs> it's one of the funner things that we get to do. I also will not read it all to you, but just know that the resolved clause is also that Madison proclaims the week of April 22nd through 28th, Climate Change Adaptation Week. Thank you again for the work you're doing and for being here. I am very eager to learn from the results of this forum, and I hope that you all learn as much as you possibly can. Please go forth and make our world a better place with the work you're doing. Thank you. I'm extremely excited to say that that was her first proclamation. <laughs> um, so starting out with climate change and climate adaptation, that's fantastic. Uh, our next speaker, uh, I'm also very excited to introduce, um, is Tia Nelson of the Outrider Foundation. Um, I know Tia from a previous iteration of her life. Uh, Tia is a tireless champion of environmental stewardship and climate change education. She spent 17 years with the Nature Conservancy, which is where I met her, in government relations as a policy advisor for, as, also as a policy advisor for Latin America and later as the first director of their global climate change initiative. She returned home to Wisconsin to serve as executive secretary of the Wisconsin Board of Commissioners of Public Lands and as co-chair of Wisconsin's Task Force on Global Warming. She directs the Outrider Foundation's climate program, uh, and she's going to share a little bit with us about that work as well as yesterday's happenings. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, a real honor for me to uh, come up on this stage after uh, our great leaders, Preston Cole, uh, Joe Parisi, our new mayor, uh, Satya, who has an enormous amount of experience in helping local communities uh, deal with both mitigation and adaptation in the face of climate change. I, um, uh, I'm going to tell you a story today, but I thought actually that I might just stand up here and repeat the words climate change over and over again. Um, 
It's very satisfying. It's very, very satisfying. Um, I want to thank Governor Ebers uh, for restoring science-based policymaking in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> and making it possible, like for public servants, which I used to be, uh, to actually speak the words uh, climate change and do their job. Um, I consider myself the luckiest child uh, in the world being born Gaylord Nelson's daughter, the founder of Earth Day. You know, don't think it hasn't occurred to me, I could have been born Richard Nixon's daughter, right? It's <laughs> like winning the lottery. I, it, but it's not quite as funny as you might imagine, as you'll see in just a moment. I'm going to show you a couple of slides. Um, Richard Nixon was a great environmental president. Um, and uh, that uh, is uh, surprising to many, um, but quite true. And I'll, I'll tell you that story in a moment. Um, because really, I'm just here to tell you a brief story, the most important part of which uh, relates back to how Preston uh, closed his remarks to you, uh, uh, imploring you never to underestimate the power of an individual act, like planting a tree, um, planting an idea. Uh, and I just want to encourage you to not underestimate uh, your power, and I'm going to do that by telling you the story of a little boy from a little town in northwestern Wisconsin. He had a really big dream, and that dream came true. It started in this car. That is my grandmother and my grandfather. They were a doctor and nurse in Clear Lake, Wisconsin. Uh, that's a Ford R uh, Roadster? Is that what it said? R Ford Roadster. My father always thought it was a Model T Ford, but I finally found this image at my mom's house recently. And why is this vehicle uh, important? It's because it's the car that my grandfather put my father in when he was 10 years old, drove him from Clear Lake, Wisconsin to Amory. This is up in Polk County. My father referred to Amory as the budding metropolis of Polk County, and if you've been there, you would think that was very funny. Um, so they got in this car, they drove over to Amory, and there my father saw Bob LaFollette Jr. speak from the back of a whistle-stop train. He was running for the United States Senate. My father was uh, awestruck, inspired. And they're driving home in that car. My grandfather asked my father what he thought. He said, that, that was very powerful. This man is helping people. I want to grow up and be a United States Senator and help people too. He said, but, I, but I'm afraid. And my grandfather asked him what he was afraid of. He said, I'm, well, I'm afraid he will have solved all the problems by the time I grow up. <laughs> That turned out not to be true. People often ask my dad where he developed his love uh, and passion for protecting nature. Um, I'm sorry that the snake is dead. He didn't kill it. Um, but the, here he is on the shores of Clear Lake. This was his playground. Nature was his playground. And the places his father took him as a child became the places that he sought to protect and preserve when he grew up and live that dream of becoming a United States Senator. Here he is, many years later as an adult, he's with uh, the chief of the Lakutare tribe, Jimmy Mustache is in, uh, steering the canoe. They're running a flotilla down the Nemecagan River up in Sawyer County uh, to draw attention to the importance of this natural resource and the importance of protecting this river my father, working in partnership with Senator Walter Mondale, um, his best buddy in the Senate, uh, subsequently got the Nebuchadnezzar and the St. Croix protected under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And I want you to understand how these childhood experiences were so impactful on how my father lived his adult life. So he became governor, he had this um, really extraordinary initiative uh, that caught the attention of the National Boating Magazine. Uh, it was called the Outdoor uh, Recreation Action Program. It was funded with a penny a pack tax on cigarettes. It was wildly popular and it was used to buy public land, public access, protect riverways, scenic ways in the state of Wisconsin. 
It was so wildly popular that the Republicans didn't want it to pass, not because they didn't like it, but because they were trying to figure out how to take credit for it. Um, but later, my father's good friend, Republican uh, Governor Warren Knowles, who succeeded my father when he was elected to the Senate, and Knowles was elected governor, um, uh, strengthened and grew this program, and today um, it is uh, a bipartisan legacy of environmental stewardship in the state of Wisconsin. The fund is called the Knowles-Nelson Stewardship Fund. My father went off to Washington as a senator with the success of uh, being the conservation governor. Um, this letter, uh, you probably can't read, and <laughs> I can't read it from here either, but I can tell you what it says. Uh, it's a letter from President Kennedy to my father saying that he's heard through Arthur Schlesinger that my father has some ideas uh, to in, uh, talk about conservation in America. And uh, the president is inviting my father to share those ideas with him. The result of this was they launched a conservation tour um, a few months before the president was assassinated. And that tour was a great failure and a great disappointment to my father. Uh, his uh, hope was that having the President of the United States talk about these issues would uh, uh, create political will, galvanize people, get them talking, and get them to act on the critical issues uh, of the time. And it didn't do that, and the tour ended up being canceled. It was a great disappointment to my father, but there was a consolation prize, which was uh, the president uh, agreed to uh, go with my father. Here they are uh, uh, arriving in the president's helicopter from Duluth uh, to uh, Ashland, uh, uh, Wisconsin population then. Uh, 10,000 people greeted them there. That was larger than the population of the town. The reason my father wanted the president to go to Ashland, Wisconsin, was because the largest freshwater archipelago, that image that you saw at the beginning of my talk, the Apostle Islands, um, now the Apostle Island National Lakeshore, a portion of which is the Gaylord Nelson Wilderness Area, designated by George, President George um, W. Bush. Um, so the consolation prize was that the president agreed to go uh, tour the Apostle Islands. And for the next seven years, my father worked to get those islands uh, protected by uh, federal law. It was a long, difficult journey. I think uh, Bud Jordahl, who helped draft the legislation, said they'd been through 12, 15 uh, drafts. It took over seven years. Um, but it is um, his perseverance and pursuit of his values that um, made him so successful. His persistence in pursuit of his values in spite of the defeats that he experienced along the way. So it was seven years after that failed conservation tour with President Kennedy that my father got on a plane and flew to uh, Santa Barbara, California to inspect the largest oil spill in the history of America at the time. And he got on a plane, was leaving um, uh, Santa Barbara, picked up a Ramparts magazine, and the cover of the magazine was a story about how college campus teach-ins on the Vietnam War were changing the course, uh, the national discourse on the morality of that war. And that's where he had the idea to call for an environmental teach-in. The original, he, the words Earth Day came much later from a New York PR firm, I think. Um, he called it Environmental Teaching Day. Not so sexy, but got to the point. It's a very simple idea, sort of strangely simple. All he did was ask all the teachers in America, in all the college campuses, in all the public K through 12 schools, to set aside a day and teach about the environment. He didn't tell them what they should teach uh, about. He thought it was important that each community think about this in their own way, think about what issues they were dealing with, what challenges they were dealing with, what issues were important to them. And it was successful beyond his wildest dreams. 20 million people gathered on that day, the largest secular event in the history of this country. Thank you. If you want to know more uh, about the story, it's a fascinating one. Adam Rome's written a, a really fascinating uh, book, and um, uh, I love reading it. Uh, his, Adam's sort of thesis of the book is the genius of Earth Day was that my father encouraged people to think 
about what was important to them and to act in their local communities in a way that was based on their own value proposition and that in giving up control of uh, what was supposed to happen, it prospered and flourished in a way it wouldn't uh, had he tried to prescribe what the agenda was, besides to set aside a day and have that conversation. So I told you, Richard Nixon wasn't, wasn't so bad on the environment uh, anyway. Uh, so he, I like to remind people the, Nash, the Environmental Protection Agency was uh, signed into law by the president. Um, uh, here's a uh, quote um, uh, that uh, he spoke. I, uh, the act I have signed gives us uh, adequate organization and a good statement of direction. We are determined that the decade of the 70s will be known as the time when this country regained a productive harmony between man and nature. The Republican President of the United States. Here are some of the, just some of the laws that were enacted in, um, one of them occurred before Earth Day, but the rest on that list uh, occurred in the first uh, year or two. Um, NOAA was created, EPA was created, the Clean Air Act was extended. There wasn't a single no vote in the United States Senate against the extension of the Clean Air Act in 1970. Not a single no vote. So I'm going to close by showing you a very brief clip of my father speaking on the eve of the first Earth Day. There's a very important message uh, for all of us in it, um, and I will speak to that once we've heard it. It's tremendously encouraging to see all across this country the uh, remarkable interest on the campuses and off the campuses on an issue which is uh, not only uh, just an issue of survival, but an issue of how we survive. I don't think there's any other issue viewed in its broadest sense, which is as critical to mankind as the issue of the quality of the environment in which we live. You hear the word ecology, that's a big science, not a narrow one. It's a big concept. And it is concerned with all the ramifications of all the relationships of all living creatures to each other and their environment. It is concerned with the total ecosystem, not just how we dispose of uh, tin cans, bottles, and our garbage. It is concerned with the habitat of marine creatures, animals, birds, and man. And our goal is not just an environment of clean air and water and scenic beauty while forgetting about the worst environments in America, in the ghettos, in Appalachians and elsewhere. Our goal is an environment of decency, quality, and mutual respect for all human beings and all other living, living creatures. An environment without ugliness, without ghettos, without poverty, without discrimination, without hunger, and without war. Our goal is a decent environment in its broadest and deepest sense. And winning the environmental war is a whole lot tougher battle challenge <clears throat> by far than any other challenge ever to confront mankind. We could terminate our involvement in Laos in 30 days, and it's my belief we should, and we could terminate our involvement. <laughs> and we could terminate our involvement in the killings in Vietnam in 120 days, and I think we should. But wish for it, work for it, fight for it, commit unlimited resources to it, nevertheless. The battle to restore a proper relationship between man and his environment, between man and other living creatures, will require a long, sustained political, moral, ethical, and financial commitment far beyond any commitment ever made by any society in the history of man. Are we able? Yes. Are we willing? That's the unanswered question. Thank you. So <laughs> it, 
it's interesting to me um, in viewing this video that at the first Earth Day, my father was defining the issue in the broadest sense. I found a, a written version of this speech which he gave elsewhere uh, where he talked about rats in the ghetto, public housing unworthy of the name. He was thinking from the very inception of Earth Day of this question of quality of life for everyone, whether we lived in the city or uh, uh, the countryside. And that commitment to uh, equality and justice was imbued in his original concept of Earth Day from the very beginning. And I think as environmentalists, we haven't done a good enough job in thinking through that lens. We've begun to do it now. Preston Cole talked about that challenge this morning. That is really the challenge uh, before us. Th the last message and I want to leave you with um, uh, is simply uh, to thank you for uh, your commitment and, and, and work uh, to make a better, more livable planet, more resilient America, um, and to remind you that sometimes perseverance and a simple idea have beget unimaginable outcomes. That's what uh, that little boy from Clear Lake did with a really big dream and it became a life legacy for him that he never anticipated. He never thought there'd be another Earth Day. That wasn't the original idea and here we are today. Um, so remember your power. Now I broke the rules. I didn't talk about Outrider. Um, you can go to our website and learn all you want. Um, <laughs> Uh, we are dedicated to educating people on existential threats of climate change and nuclear weapons, helping people understand the risks and, most importantly, the opportunities we all have as individuals to make a difference, to make the world uh, a safer and better place. And with that, um, I uh, express my deep gratitude to all of you for your life's work. Thank you. Um, at the first National Adaptation Forum, uh, we had a full demonstration of what a community event this is. Not only is there that very long list of people who are part of all of the committees, you'll meet a few more of those in a moment, um, but uh, there's also just everything that all of you bring to the event and make it. Uh, in Denver, there was a participant from Alaska. If that person is here, they should stand up and take credit for this as I talk about it. Um, who came up to me, uh, I believe on the third day of the forum, about an hour and a half before the closing plenary, and said, I feel really guilty having traveled this far to come to something so amazing and having burnt carbon to do it. What can we do about that? And I was, we had an hour and a half. I said, I don't know what we could do about that. Someone else on my team said, we could give money to the bike share program here in Denver so that we could decrease carbon emissions in Denver. And we took up a contribution at the closing plenary, like literally buckets by the doors as people left. It was announced in the closing plenary by that person. Is that person here from Alaska? Okay. Um, she's, I have to find out what her name is so that we can actually formally thank her. So every forum since then, we have gone out and found a local project that does adaptation locally uh, that uh, we can support. And we refer to it as our Travel Guilt Offset Program. Uh, so this year, we, we repeated this trend. Um, you're about to meet the Travel Guilt Offset Program representatives, but I want to remind you as you're listening to this that you can still make a donation either online through the forum website or come up to the registration booth if you'd just like to hand over cash to alleviate your guilt. Um, this year, the project that we uh, identified and picked from all the incredible things that are going on in the greater Madison area, and yesterday there was a field trip there, was the Center for Resilient Cities um, Badger Rock Center. Uh, and did anyone go on that field trip yesterday? A few folks? Um, uh, the representatives we have today who are going to share something about that with us are Marsha Canton Campbell and Sarah Carlson. Are you guys here? You're over there. Come on up.
I had the pleasure of visiting their site on my last visit here, and it is very cool. Thank you. Positioned okay? All right. I'm Marsha Caton Campbell. Um, I'm the executive director of the Center for Resilient Cities. And I'm Sarah Carlson, the Badger Rock urban farmer. Badger Rock is a hidden gem on Madison's south side. It's this year's National Adaptation Forum Travel Guilt Offset Partner. <laughs> I didn't know about the guilt part. Um, <laughs> And the beautiful photos that you're going to see scrolling behind us, um, I don't know if we're responsible for starting them, but I'll see if we are. Um, they're timed, so hopefully you'll get to see them all. Um, we're taken by our colleague and friend, Hetty Rudd, who is, stand up Hetty, please, uh, who is our neighborhood center director, and uh, they are snapshots of life at Badger Rock. So Badger Rock is home to a neighborhood center, a public charter middle school that's grounded in environmental sustainability and 21st century learning, and a sustainable urban farm. And we have a variety of motivations in the work that we do. Uh, we are community driven. We practice deep listening and relationship building. We depend on community involvement and leadership. And we build community partnerships and share resources. We care about sustainable and just food systems. We work toward healthy food access and food sovereignty, the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. But most of all, what we're about at the Center for Resilient Cities and Badger Rock is a resilient community and the resilient the resilience of people in that community. That's our primary focus. So at Badger Rock Middle School, we teach um, students in grades six through eight, and we teach about social, economic, and environmental sustainability and resilience, social justice, and urban agriculture, food systems, and ecological systems through project-based, hands-on, active learning. Our focus is on student voice and choice, design and inquiry, community engagement and authentic experiences, social emotional, emotional learning, and restorative justice. Um, Badger Rock's middle school's garden class, which I teach, uh, blends growing food year round, culinary arts and life skills, science, math, art, and environmental studies, food justice, and cultivates future food systems leaders. At the Badger Rock Neighborhood Center, we offer community-driven programming and events monthly community meals in partnership with Badger Rock Middle School, community gardens and culinary classes, a pop-up cooperative community market and farm stand, kitchen space, which is rentable by, for micro-businesses, several of which have launched into larger food enterprises, a polling place, and uh, many community par partnerships focused on health, wellness, and connection. Thanks to your travel guilt Offset Partnership, we're increasing the number of Badger Rock community garden beds this year by 50% and expanding our urban orchard with a number of winter hardy dwarf fruit trees. If you've not yet had a chance to contribute, please do. Uh, you'll really be uh, helping the resilience of a community with the gifts that you make. And to those who've contributed already, we thank you very much. We're sorry to have missed Preston Cole. We worked with him in Milwaukee uh, some years ago, and uh, we're really pleased to see him rise in the DNR. Um, and we want to wish you an enjoyable time in Madison. The weather is supposed to get better this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It becomes more and more formal every year, the whole process with the travel guilt offset. Um, I don't think we've, uh, we've consistently had people actually come to present. Um, next up on the agenda is a little bit of a surprise. Um, I will advance this. A lot of people in this room know Robin O'Malley. Uh, Robin is currently the director of the Department of the Interior North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, an entity that I think keeps adding words to its name. 
Uh, but he's also had a storied career uh, with, uh, he's previously been a policy and partnership coordinator at the USGS National Climate Adaptation Science Center, director of not one but two programs at the H. John Hines, the third center for science, economics, and the environment, the chief of staff for, do you remember the National Biological Survey? Uh, the science assistant to the interior secretary, Bruce Babbitt, deputy science advisor to the interior department, associate director for the natural resource, for natural resources at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, do we have a CEQ anymore? Uh, and senior environmental advisor for Governor Keene of New Jersey. Throughout all of that, uh, one of the things that has stood out in people's engagement with Robin is that he's always been a champion of earlier, early career professionals and women of all ages. When we heard that Robin was retiring from this illustrious career in adaptation, we thought two things. One, we weren't aware that was something a person could do. Thank you, Lynn manuel Miranda. And two, how can we show our appreciation for his work championing adaptation in science and policy? Uh, around adaptation. Um, with the forum, we realized we had an opportunity that we did not want to miss. We are very pleased to uh, award the inaugural Margaret A. Davidson Adaptation Career Excellence, or MAD ACE Award, to Robin O'Malley. Robin, could you please come up? We are proud to award this to you. Uh, it is, um, in addition to it being of archival quality, laminated and all, uh, it's the first of uh, 52 very large playing cards that you can have. Um, we also want to commemorate your work with uh, one of Margaret Davidson's famous Margaretisms. Uh, this was provided by her team at NOAA. They gave me a collection of 20. I, with their permission, will come up with a way to share the rest. But given your career, uh, this is the one that I thought was most appropriate for you. Politics is much harder than <laughs> physics. A truism in the ongoing battle to do something about climate change. Uh, thank you, Robin, for spending a career trying to make politicians understand what physics means yep. and that we have to do something about it. Additionally, we are making you an honorary oh. EcoAdapt team member. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, well, thank you. Um, that's the most important thing to say. And I am truly blown away to be in the same uh, circuit as Margaret. Um, uh, I don't know how many folks here know her. Uh, she has passed on. Uh, but she was a great force in the, in the community that we are. And that's what I want to say is that I, in doing what I've been able to do, um, I've stood on the shoulders of giants and I've walked alongside giants. And Margaret is one of them, and a lot of folks in this room are also in that category. Um, so I really feel like I've benefited from an enormous community of support um, and, and contribution to our work. Um, I did have the opportunity to be, um, in 1988, part of the first state action. Governor Tom Kane signed an executive order on climate change. We were way ahead of the curve. It took a while for things to catch up. But seeing state, county, municipal, and other kinds of leadership really embracing this stuff now is, is gratifying. It's come a long way. It's taken a long time, but it's taken root. Um, I said to a meeting that we had last week uh, that we face an existential crisis, and I'm not joking about that. Um, the fires, the floods, the health issues, um, everything that we're seeing around us um, really has that level of uh, importance and, and urgency to it. And we don't have institutions that are capable of dealing with it yet. Um, and I, I want to make this a couple statements that are not intended at all to be in the current political realm, and I'm not joking about that. But just for example, we don't have institutions that are capable of handling the kind of migration that's going to happen. Look what's happening. Forget about the southern border in the U.S. Look what's happening in Africa. Um, and it's only beginning to start. When the, when the pressure really amps up, um, there's going to be a lot of people on the move, and we're just not capable of handling that yet. So we need to build institutions. 
And unfortunately, we don't, as a species, do a really good job at looking ahead and making plans. There are some institutions that do that, and I'll actually mention DOD, um, which is really good at thinking ahead and thinking through the options. They're really good at planning. They've brought to us the whole practice of scenario planning. That's um, a lot of where it came into um, larger uh, use in society. So, um, but what we're trying to do in this room is counter to a lot of trends. We are trying to incorporate tribes into our decision making and thinking and giving them the agency. The same with um, low income communities and communities of color. Um, that's not uh, the mainstream agenda these days. Um, as I said, we're looking forward and we're trying to anticipate and doing something. And we're trying to do that both using science, which is where I come from, but bringing people into the mix like we heard in the last presentation on our GILT program. Um, and we're trying to do that while we're dealing with real problems now. Lead in the water and nitrate in the water can make your kids sick. And, and uh, those are real, urgent, immediate problems that we still have to deal with. Secretary Cole has to deal with that. That's banging on his door. But he's also in a place where he's getting up above the daily um, noise. So we've got real urgent problems that won't go away now that are biting us in the butt. Um, and we've got to look out ahead. So I really uh, I want to, again, thank you for the um, recognition. Um, what can I say? Margaret was one of the most amazing people I know, so to be connected with her is uh, really um, special. Thank you. Okay, I promised earlier you would get to meet some more of the committee members. Um, two of our committee co-chairs uh, will be for doing our next presentation. Um, Adrienne Hollis from the Union of Concerned Scientists, who is in her first year as a co-chair on the steering committee, um, and Amy Delac from Defenders of Wildlife, who uh, Defenders of Wildlife has been the earliest and most consistent supporter of the National Adaptation Forum in its entire career. So welcome up for a presentation on adaptation from equity to ecosystems. Thank you, Laura. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> That's the professor in me, sorry. Um, we've all been thoroughly wel and warmly welcomed, so we just want to add to that and to give you a taste of what is in store for the rest of the week. We're going to be talking about so many different um, issues, sharing ideas, creating new friendships, renewing old friendships, um, that it's going to be a powerful week. This late, late last year, we were the recipients of two very important reports, one from the IPCC and one for, from the National Climate Assessment 4. The bottom line from both of those reports is that deadly wildfires, increasingly debilitating hurricane and heat waves um, are already battering the United States. And, if, if I may add a caveat to what our last speaker said, we've been facing existential threats for a long time, especially in the environmental justice communities. And it's, you can't talk about this conference without talking about equity. And I'm glad that it's a big part of the conference here. Um, as reiterated in the NAACP document prepared by Jackie Patterson, the Senior Director of Environment and Cli Climate Justice, um, in the document entitled Fossil Fuel Foolery, released on April 1st, appropriately. For those of you who haven't read it, I recommend that you do. It reiterates that low-income communities and nations in the global south are feeling the extreme impacts of climate change, first and worse. Tragic results include shifts in agricultural yield, which impact food access in, in areas where food is already scarce. Flooding, displacement of communities by sea level rise, loss of life and livelihood are just some of the issues you'll be hearing about this week. So welcome and we hope you um, appreciate and enjoy each other. So to start. Um, as the U.S. comes to um, 
as we struggle with certain um, damage from multiple national disa disasters, like wildfires, as I mentioned earlier, damage in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and in the Midwest and uh, in the Southeast and other places, it appears that there's still some confusion about climate change and um, global warming. And as an example of that, I show you the Trump, um, excuse me, the tweet by President Trump in the beautiful Midwest, wind chill temperatures are reaching minus 60 degrees, the coldest ever recorded. In coming days, expect it to get even colder. People can't last outside for minutes. Uh, um, what the hell is going on with global warming? Please come back fast. We need you. Really? <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, wait, what? You know, so I know that we all know the difference between global warming and climate change, but just to reiterate that global warming is actually a symptom of the much, much larger problem um, of human-caused climate change, in my opinion. And so let's keep that in mind when we see um, examples of people who just don't understand or just don't get that. Yeah, so the, the, the irony, I guess, of, of tweeting about it being cold in wintertime as if that's something strange is really a reminder that it is becoming something strange. Our winters are not as cold. And, you know, so this whole on the Titanic, if we're sinking, why are we hundreds of feet up in the air? If cl the climate is changing, why is winter cold? Well, that's a very good question. Our winters have not been as cold as they used to be. And that's a problem. It's a problem, believe it or not, we need cold winters. And one of the things that cold winters do is they cut back our pest populations, particularly ticks. And what we're seeing, because the winters have not been as cold, tick populations are exploding across the country, particularly in the upper Midwest, including Wisconsin and New England. Moose are being so infested with ticks. 100,000 ticks have been found on a single individual moose. They're dying of anemia because of all the blood loss from tick infestations. And at this point, you might be thinking, whew, lucky for me, I'm not a moose. Well, I have news. Ticks also spread human diseases, and those are on the rise as well. This is uh, Lyme disease, of course. Ticks also spread Rocky Mountain spotted fever and a number of other uh, debilitating and even fatal diseases, and those are all on the rise. What happens to nature happens to people, and we should never forget that in the course of this conference and in our work. So in 2017, which is, one, which ha, is going down in history as one of the costliest um, weather um, hurricane seasons of um, the um, recent past, um, over 700 people were killed, probably a lot more than that. Over $320 billion in damages were um, seen as a result of mainly three hurricanes, um, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. In 2018, NOAA um, officially, uh, NOAA reported that the hurricane season will be remembered as um, particularly damaging due to two hurricanes. Hurricane Florence, which as we know, pretty much decimated a lot of areas um, in the southwest, southeast, and Hurricane um, Michael, which was a Category 4, but as of last Friday, was recategorized as a Category 5 hurricane when it landed in, the, in Florida. So um, it's, it took two or three weeks for many rivers in the, South Carolina, in the Carolinas to decrease, and some people are still in the midst of recovering. So here we talk about mitigation, and I think um, later we'll touch on some adaptation efforts that may make um, a difference. And again, what happens to people happens to nature. Amid the devastation of those hurricanes, a number of bird populations really also suffered. This is the Atwater's prairie chicken, one of the rarest uh, subspecies in the United States, found in the wild only in two small preserves south of Houston, used to occur across the entire Texas coastal prairie. Eighty percent of the birds found in the wild were killed by Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Irma, oh, excuse me, Hurricane Maria devastated habitat 
for another of the rarest birds in the country, uh, the uh, Puerto Rican parrot in El Yonque National Forest on Puerto Rico. And Hurricane Irma was also devastating for species like the Miami blue butterfly and the uh, Cape Sable seaside sparrow. A commercial break. <laughs> no, not really. Um, a 2018 CNN report headline read, Giant Mosquitoes Emerge in North Carolina um, Post-Florence. The headline in a South Carolina paper read, Monster Mosquitoes prey on, Preys on South Carolina um, on the Coast After Hurricane Florence. And we joke about it, but it's really a serious uh, issue. You know, the whole issue of, of possibility of vector-borne diseases and climate change. These mosquitoes, while maybe not this big, although some were described um, by some of my friends as being that big, were three to six times the, the size of regular mosquitoes um, to the point where some people thought they were wasps. They were so big and they could bite through two layers of clothing. Mosquitoes are the Wisconsin state bird, if I understand correctly. <laughs> so, when you, you'll hear about equity issues and resiliency and people working together. And I know a lot of you recall this um, historic moment when uh, President Trump threw paper towels into the community. What I'd like you to do is when we play it over is look at the woman to the left of the president as she quietly, and this is my interpretation, hands out bags of rice while he's not looking to the audience. Perfect example of how we have to help ourselves and work together. So if you see her little hand there, so. <laughs> so enough of the bad news. We're here this week to talk about solutions. And what we really want to highlight is, just as with the impacts of climate change, what happens to people happens to nature. With the solutions, what happens to nature happens to people. And so some of the things I think you're going to hear about this week are the importance of protecting habitat. So when you've got you know, remaining intact forest around your city, uh, that helps not just for the species that live in that habitat, it also helps by reducing flood water inflow, uh, lowering the, the, the impact of those severe events to reduce flooding and to protect people. Mm -hmm. Now this is an example of the Anacostia Tunnel. And the reason I, we put this up here is because we talk about flooding and wastewater and sewage treatment, um, well, the lack of sewage of treatment for water um, in, in areas where you have a lot of rain and, and flooding issues. So with the, sewage <laughs> with the sewage treatment plants like the Anacostia Tunnel or the one in Milwaukee or the one in Seattle, it's, uh, it'll serve as a holding tank sort of, for wastewater that can then be treated, or this mixture of sewage and um, rainwater that can then be treated before it's released to the river. So here's another uh, uh, sort of good news about ways to deal with contaminated water. Another example is the bioswell, which is, <laughs> which is just a way, if you look at the, the plants, some plants are known to take up some pollutants, and I know some communities are interested in using particular plants for that purpose, but this also is a way to um, get the water off the street, help with flooding, and um, um, the, decrease the contaminated water that enters our um, rivers and lakes and streams. And I want to thank Secretary Cole earlier for highlighting the importance of urban trees in mitigating the heat island effect uh, at the Adaptation Forum. We know that that's so important that that was our Travel Guild offset project in 2017. Uh, the town of uh, St. Paul was having issues with trees dying due to changed climate conditions. So we had a group of folks planting trees that will be better adapted to future additions to, future conditions, a little bit more heat tolerant, and those will provide habitat for birds and insects as well as reduce that heat island effect and make the urban environment uh, better for everyone. Uh, stream bank restoration and other kinds of plantings are also very important. Uh, that vegetation will cool the water, it will also hold the water, keep it from flowing into the stream as fast, reducing flooding, reducing pollutant levels. Again, what's good for nature is good for people as well. 
And just one last uh, thought for me is when we think about ecology, we think about economy. That word root both comes from the Greek oikos. It means home. We've only got one home, and let's work this week to protect it. And what we do know is that we must be the change that we seek. We need to work together, and we hope that this week will be the start of, as I mentioned earlier, new partnerships. We hope you leave here engaged and ready to continue to fight against climate change. Thank you. So now we're going. Oh, it's on? Okay. So uh, now they need to change the stage for just a few moments while we, um, we'll do a bit of an icebreaker so that you guys don't have to just sit here bored while they are getting ready for the, uh, the main plenary. So I want you to meet some of your neighbors at your table. I know it's the discussion time, introverts. I know, I know. So raise your hand, actually, if you're a first time attendee of the National Adaptation Forum. All right, great, we have a lot of first time attendees. It looks like maybe one at almost every table. So somebody else at your table who's been here before, give that person a piece of advice. Or somebody come over here because these two ladies are first timers. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do the next one? Oh, oh shoot. Say, okay. oh. <laughs> you have the. I don't have it. I forgot to take that with me. Go ahead. And while we do that, another question. Just raise your hand. How many of you are students? We have one student in the whole room, two students? Come on. <laughs> more How many people there we are go. students? There's some more students. All right. <laughs> so tell, if you're a student, tell your neighbors uh, where you're studying and what you're studying. Or if you're not a student and are affiliated with a university, tell your neighbors all about that. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> they're still giving advice? Yeah. Uh, it looks, actually, it looks like they are almost. Okay. Okay. How many people are repeat offenders who've been to every single forum? Outstanding. All right. <laughs> Tell your neighbors the most interesting thing you've learned in eight years of going to national adaptation forums. Or if you've been to fewer, share that too. I'm going to ask one person to say it out loud. Again. Okay, sure. And while you do that, we're going to get one person to tell everybody what they've learned. Oh, oh here you go. <laughs> I think what I learned is that there's amazing, amazing things happening. And if we band together and we find those little pieces of hope that we really can make the change we want to see. That was a good one. Very good. Thank you. Maybe we can get one more. So she was going to pass what, huh? it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the stuff we're talking about? So what we, we learned about for four years? Learned, but I learned that you can meet some of your best friends by working together on issues that affect all of us. So the silver lining is you get to meet wonderful people. Very good. Two great topics. Can do that one? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that one? Where? Okay, how many of you attended the field trip yesterday? I didn't, my plane was late. <laughs> Anybody else? You were there? That's right, because you were wet, I know. Anybody else? Nobody went? Gee, he went. Did you learn, what's the one thing you would say is a takeaway from that trip? That there's a lot of traditional ecological knowledge that's founded within this. <clears throat> There's a lot of traditional ecological knowledge within the campus for uh, the indigenous people here of the Ho-Chunk Nation. So it's a really nice, knowledgeable tour to yesterday. Right. Great information. So those of you who missed the tour yesterday missed some great um, information, ecological information. All right, and we are just about ready for the plenary, but we want to leave everyone with one more icebreaker question to maybe just think about and talk after the plenary. 
How is climate change emotionally affecting you? And what is your wicked question? And if you need to think a little bit more about wicked questions, you can find that out at booth 38. No, oh, now it's quiet. So everybody, we'd like to direct your attention to the screen. How is climate change emotionally affecting you? And as we were told, you can get more information on wicked questions by going to booth 38. Yep. And with that. And with that, we're done. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks. Oh. I think I need the slide advancer.